I think the idea was that I was going to make it so that the back end of this would let the front end just do whatever it wanted for now. And then on the front end, I might try to use this tool stuff in um, GPT 4.0. And I think it was in previous, like the, like the API definition stuff is, you know, kind of separate from the, um, model, right? Somewhat. I wonder if I could, uh, maybe, hmm. So on the one hand, if I do the tool approach, then in the response, there is going to be like a separate place where it's like passing the JSON that I'm after, um, rather than in the actual response itself. Or I could just change the, uh, let's go back to the API reference, or I could just change the response format to be JSON object. And then if I did that, that wouldn't necessarily um, produce the right JSON. I mean, Granted, telling it about the tool and stuff might not also might also not have it produce the right JSON, but I guess let's just try. Let's try try providing in a response format. I think part of how this at least how I'm using it, this right now is that every response should be a JSON object um, coming back. So if nothing else. Um, messages model, there should be a parameter here called format and there's not probably because in cargo.toml I'm using, using version 2.0.2.13 of OpenAI Dive and it's currently 0.4.8. Let's update that and we're doing things. I'm gonna open this letter while we're waiting. All right, now things are broken. Oh, nice. Ah, that makes sense. Mm, that's decent. Got some uh, luggage tags for my next trip. All right, so uh, now everything's broken, right? <laughs> the API has changed. Um, so it's chat now. And then interesting, interesting. Um, some tools, tool call ID, tool calls. Okay, so those are optional. So basically, this this map, this function that we're, we're um, we have here, is converting the simple chat message struct, which is what the um, the front end of this application is sending to this API, and it's translating it into a chat message that then is then um, being turned into an HTTP request going to OpenAI. Right. So we have to like. Fill in. Ooh, we can just. Can we do that? Is that a thing? Default. Dot. Dot. Default. Default. Okay. Um. 
Expected chat ma chat message content found string. Okay, okay. So yeah, the the, the API here changed a little bit. Uh, let's see. Chat message content. Oh right, so it can be text or it can be an image URL now, or none. But this is always going to be text, like that. Of course, we've not imported that. I feel like the amount of time this is taking, I could probably just, it's probably in there, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, shorthand, yeah, we can just use that. Okay, what's the remaining error? Right, so now, this is no longer a string. We have um, a something. Right, this is a, come on, I wanna control click you, there we go. It's a chat message content, right? Uh, so that can be either text or image URL or none. Mm. We don't have a, uh... can we just do it into? Nope. Hmm, does that work? Nope, doesn't have a two string. Doesn't implement display. I guess what we need to do is like, we're just gonna kind of do a naive thing here. We're, we're gonna match based on this. Yeah, so if it's a chat message content text, it has some text, then we'll use it. Otherwise, anything else, we'll just say, hey, no content. Now, cannot move out of index. Consider borrowing. Can we do that? Okay. Is this uh No, we need to copy it. Can we do that? Yeah, we can do that. All right. We'll make a copy of text, I think is what that ends up doing. All right, well, that stops all the errors. And that just that just handles us upgrading <laughs> to the new version of OpenAI Dive. Um, and then what I want to do is I want to say that the parameters here for the check completion parameters we should have new options now, right? So we should have uh, tools, which is the other thing I was thinking about using, but response format. Um, let's go back to the API docs here. Control F, response format. Yeah, like audio. Yeah, text to speech. Transcribes audio into the input language. So this is where you could actually, like we could upload an audio file, but I'm doing that all locally anyway. Uh, otherwise I probably, <laughs> probably would have run out of that $10 much sooner. Uh, anyway, I was looking to see if we have like a response format. response format in this package no let's take a look completion response something about JSON in here yeah because it mm, there we go check completion response format format type Okay, that's that's a lot. Let's go back a little bit.
Yep. I'm just thinking that's a lot of steps. <laughs> <laughs> like we need to build, we need to say like, uh, th this response format, right, is, you know, needs to be something like what, some, um, so like that's not valid, right? It doesn't have a JSON, right? Because this is just a struct that has this. There's not something that implements that. I'm just looking to see if there's something that would be helpful for building this, and there's not. Okay. It's annoying. Uh, let's see. There, comma. right although we're missing that from there yeah 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 I but I did why don't you update what you know there we go JSON object that's what I'm after okay cool so I'm basically saying that every response coming back from the API call should come back as a JSON object and at least in like the one use case I have for calling this API, that's true. At some point that may become false. Now, also the other side of this is that this is not encoding in this what the shape of the response should be. So that, that comes down to like the prompt itself, right? The front end is providing. Whereas if I were to take a different approach where I was using that kind of like defining tools which I think is another parameter here, right? Tool choice and tools. So if I were to build out that, then I could tell it specifically like, oh, there's this tool for defining a YouTube video and here are the parameters and here's what that looks like using JSON schema. Um, and then I would tell the prompt, like I would say in the prompt to do a thing that there is a tool to do. Like I would define the tool using some words and I would use the same words describe what I want the effectively like this agent to do and it would in turn say in the response to use the tool so in the response there would likely be something like uh, response dot what's in response right um, or it might be in the individual like probably in choices, uh, sub zero, oops, dot, um, message, tool calls, right? And then I would need to translate that back into what I'm feeding back to the front end for it to work. And that's just a little bit more involved. And I figured it would be just a little bit easier to try doing this way and see if we get a better result, right? So let's just rebuild. And uh, we'll go back to the front end after this build finishes and see what that looks like. Is that is that better? I wonder 
I kind of still like this idea of maybe just on the front end having like a persistent, like having chat sessions, um, not tied to like, because right now, what I'm effectively doing, I think we can close this stuff for now. We can always go back to it. What I'm doing is, is like this chat session stuff is embedded and we're probably going to get a, a flash here once uh, the build happens and everything gets restarted. But uh, the, the, the chat info is embedded inside of uh, the components in the screen, right? So it's very local state to within uh, this part of the application. And so maybe lifting that out um, where there's some kind of global state for the application, but just maybe just in the front end for now um, could make sense. Now, maybe what that ends up looking like is like, hmm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that because it, it's interesting because long term, and I think I was talking about this before the break, right? Some of this is not going to be part of this React admin application necessarily. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, that, that workflow stuff could be part theoretically part of the react admin app without actually like fitting like the UI model of this, right? Where we just have, just like I have like Twitch import. Uh, well, that's, that's not the best example. It's still like a list view. It still has a record type, but something like even beyond that, um, where I have just like a page that's not part of react admin in terms of, it's not a resource, it doesn't have a list view, none of this stuff, but still embedded inside of it. Um, and the reason I'm thinking about this is because we have like this data provider layer that says how to talk to the backend, right? And so when I'm looking at calling the backend APIs um, to like ultimately interface with GPT-4 or whatever, um, I don't want to have to rebuild. It's it's a thin front end like layer, but maybe I don't want to have to rebuild that. Maybe I want also maybe I want to have these components that still work, right? In that context um, of like using the the hooks from React Admin to call that API. So maybe my ultimate like. UI that I'm building will still be part of this, this React Admin app. Um, maybe, maybe. Uh, and, and if that's the case, then what I could do is I could have um, some kind of state managed in the front end that might, ooh, very bright for a second, um, that might like store data about these chat sessions in uh, the browser's uh, local storage, right? So that would be persisted just then in this browser. So if I went to a different computer, I might not have that, but um, hmm, I could do it that way. Or I mean, at that point, maybe Maybe I do want to have that stored persisted. Huh. I think maybe I don't have to decide that right now. So there is something in React Admin. Uh, let's see, docs. Why can't, why can't they have a dark mode? <laughs> Um, there's something in the Ra React Admin feature-wise, like user preferences. Right? From the store. Stored values are available globally and are persisted between page loads, right? 
And this is effectively what I'm looking for. Um, hmm, use store context. Should not be used directly, yep. Configurable. Sure. Do I... A global synchronous persistent store for storing user preferences. Maybe, I mean, that, that's that's an approach, right? To treat kind of this, this stuff as kind of um, from that perspective. The other thing I could do is treat the kind of the chat session stuff as its own kind of record type in React Admin, right? So like you could imagine like chat sessions. Hmm. I might have to think about different wording there because that conflicts with like, think about like, stream chat stuff. So maybe like, um, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to think about the words. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll use, uh, um, chat GPT <laughs> to brainstorm this later. Uh, anyway. Uh, so if we did finish re rebuilding though, yes. So what uh, we can do is I have the same prompt, right? At this point, the only things that I've changed are I've changed the model from GPT-4 Turbo to GPT-4 O Omni. Um, I've not changed the prompt. We're using the full transcript of like, uh, for the essentially the, the first hour of the stream from towards the end of March. Um, so that's the same, but I've changed the response type to be explicitly a JSON response. Uh, so, I mean, I was kind of getting that already, right? At least some of the time I was getting just a JSON um, content without any kind of like decoration. So what does it look like now? So it's still JSON. It is structured properly. Now we have a title, a description, keywords, and chapters. Um, so that looks pretty good, right? So if I click use this message, hey, and it is valid parsable JSON. Right, so then it, it updated the uh, title slightly, maybe. In this episode, we continue to work on gluing Telegram using Elixir. So this is the stream from, again, about two months ago at this point, there we go, 324. Uh, environment variables, API tokens, integrating ch Twitch chat, debugging methods, handle state management, text elixir code to ensure seamless. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a relaxed Sunday morning coding session. Functional programming, WebSockets, and Elixir. All right, and then timestamps that may or may not be accurate. <laughs> once I uh, get through actually rendering things out. But yeah, that looks that looks pretty good. Um, I still I still want to think about No, like this specific thing, I think this is this is no longer um, making a higher level API for asking for JSON and validating it is not needed anymore. Right? Because um, uh, OpenAI has made their API so that I can just say I want that. So I don't I don't need to do that anymore. Um, so that's this issue number eighty. I'm just gonna have it generate a new commit message. Uh, yeah, I mean technically. Hmm. So let's do a thing. So what I want to do is I want to actually commit this as two separate commits, one with the update of OpenAI Dive and the other one that actually uh, updates it to use the um, um, response format, right? So I want to commit this separately. So I could just like commit the cargo changes, but um, that wouldn't be valid, right? Because that sure that would update the dependency, but that would be
be like if you were to check out just this commit, which this commit is gonna get die anyway, right? Because we're gonna squash merge it. Um, but let's just pretend that I wasn't squash merging everything. Uh, a thing that you could do, like I could just start backing out changes, um, which honestly might be easier because there are things that I'm importing here, like these things. So let me cut those temporarily, right? And then what I wanna do is I'm gonna select this area and I'm gonna say uh, stage selected ranges, right? And so that's gonna disappear off the diff. And then I need to update this as well. So stage select changes and then stage selected ranges, right? So I can stage all these separate changes, but leave out the addition of the response format field and then commit that, uh, cancel, Let's save, there you go. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Um, stage that, white space change. Okay, cool, and then we'll commit that and so that will be the um, the the changes to upgrade OpenAI Dive, and then so these changes are what are necessary to add the response format, right? So then it does this sometimes, which I know chat is kind of in in the way of that, but uh, there you go, where it will <laughs> it'll look. This is old news. We already did this. Why don't you give me a new commit message? There you go. Also, I don't know the other commit is technically speaking. I don't know you would label that as a feature, but that's what it did. So yeah, it's kind of hit or miss. The uh, it, it can be really cool sometimes, the generating commit message with uh, Copilot, but sometimes it's just, it's not, it, it's not keeping up with what's going on. All right, so anyway. Publish that. Uh, come back over here. All right. What I want to say is, I the 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 thrust of this is to add uh, a JSON response format field to check completion parameters. Uh, and uh, AI uh, API service. And that solves the problem that I was trying to solve here with this with this item, right? Which was, hey, I want the <laughs> result to be uh, well formatted JSON. It, it doesn't completely, it doesn't communicate um, formally like the, the shape of the data, but that's already in the prompt, right? So the, the definition of this agent, what's in the, the chat completion, like payload defines, actually gives a literal example of what the JSON should look like. Uh, and that seems to be good enough. So uh, until it's not. All right. Well, Uh, let's go from this to maybe looking at those other annotations. Let's see, what was that under checks? Let me check. There we go. There's, there's only uh, several of them. <laughs> there's a few of them. Uh, let's, let's do that next. And then I think um, we can kind of go from that to maybe figuring out who will raid. Yeah. All right, so refresh this. I think it was like 86, there we go. 
Okay, so common API lib. Do I not have? Oh yeah, get one's launch path. Can we can we hide that? Hide that. There we go. I I got enough things. So it thinks that common API lib soc lib.rs line 12 is redundant. Lib.rs line 12. Tracing. Uh, I guess that makes sense. I'm surprised. Yeah, I'm not getting errors from. Uh. Hey, it's no bother. Uh, how do I say your name? Zine? Is that all right? What do I think about the future of Rust programming language? I'm a front-end developer. I'm considering learning, learning something new. I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I, I wouldn't say that I'm really plugged into like, um, like what's gonna happen with Rust. Um, I, I would say generally, my preference, like if part of why I'm using Rust on this project was because I didn't really have any strong preferences, like, oh, I need to use this library and it's in this language, that sort of thing. And I, I like Rust for system level programming Maybe things that are maybe a little bit lower level than what I'm doing here. and But I wanted uh, an excuse to use Rust on a project. And it, it has been something where there are things that, as someone who mainly writes TypeScript day to day and people can follow. Um, Zane underscore Q just <laughs> followed. Thanks for the follow. It, someone who, you know, day to day mostly writes TypeScript uh, for front end and back end, like Node.js uh, back end, uh, a lot of like AWS Lambda stuff, other things. But um, there's definitely things where it feels sometimes jumping through hoops, which is funny because it's the same criticism you'll hear like JavaScript versus TypeScript. Oh, you're gonna have, you have to do all these types and things and whatnot. Um, but there's a lot more flexibility in terms of, I feel like expressiveness and looseness of types in TypeScript, TypeScript versus in Rust having to, as an example, and this is an example, and I think it's gonna depend on what libraries and tooling you want to use. So like I'm using Diesel to um, interact with the Postgres database, right? And so there's a lot of types that are coming from, um, like this is the schema of this table, here's how I interact with it, that it makes it kind of awkward if I want to have a function that is interacting, but you know potentially with multiple different tables, right? Kind of having general functions. Um, that may be somewhat just me, uh, like I know how I might do that with things like ConnectJS or something else. In TypeScript, it feels a little bit a little bit awkward. Um, ended up like writing a macro uh, to do the same thing, like having reusable code for a um, endpoint, like a HTTP endpoint, uh, to interact with you know like providing a list view for different kinds of tables, right? This is this is maybe kind of like a meandering response to your question, but um, if, I wouldn't want to say that if I were to do it over, I would do it in TypeScript, but I think if I were to do this project if I had to start this project over from scratch, where I'm at with Rust, I think I would still be much faster doing it in TypeScript. Um, and given the fact that, you know, 
in this hypothetical world in which I've you know already had the experience, I think it, it could be valuable to do the project again if I had to uh, and rest again and like do it better. Um, but I wouldn't say it's gonna depend. Um, there's a lot to be said. Um, if you, as a front end developer, if, if you're doing JavaScript, you're doing TypeScript, there's a lot to be said for doing, uh, TypeScript on the back end too. The project that I was streaming before this one on Sundays, um, uh, Daily Jewel had a TypeScript back end and I was using, uh, TRPC and things like that. And, um, there were still concerns of like, you know, aligning back end versus front end and like kind of thinking about what makes sense as inter as interfaces as you're going down the stack. Um, but like problems that I have not solved here that I may not bother really solving. I might just do by hand, but you probably would want to figure out how you want to manage. Um, oh, this is what the API looks like how are you getting TypeScript types in your front end to interact with it if, if it's that kind of application? Uh, I suppose that a lot of, a lot of that betrays that a lot of what I do is like web focused stuff, right? Backends that are providing APIs for front end services where there is like a web app, some kind of uh, more complex front end application uh, with its own state that's interacting with a backend because that's a lot of what I do. So I hope that I feel like I'm kind of like circuitously going around the question that you're asking. Um, but I hope that helped at least somewhat. <laughs> um, but I would say more generally and more to the point, learn something new, definitely. Um, the more programming languages that you learn, the more kind of, um, different kind of ideas and concepts of how to solve problems. Those are just more tools in the toolbox. Even if you don't use that language in the future, getting exposure to the ideas that were put into the creation of that is going to be useful for future problem solving, you know, learn a lisp learn prologue, uh, learn, <laughs> um, SQL. Yeah. Get those functional and declarative kind of ideas in there too. So this claims that this use tracing is not used. Okay. Can we, we can't just, uh, can I, is all of this in? No, it's not all in common API lib. Okay. So we get two warnings about the same line. Not sure why that is. Is it the same message? Maybe it could be because it's imported from multiple places. I'm not sure why we're getting two messages about that. And then, um, why did the music stop? Pretzel, why? why? Why are you stopping the music? Uh, transcription API, which we've not touched in a while. Uh, also, this is probably just copy paste, right? Or maybe Copilot uh, wrote this line four. We're not using .env, dot, dot .env. <laughs> we are, um, but it's not necessary. Because, uh, because we're, how do, how do imports work Oops. in Rust? Okay, that's fine. A well-maintained fork of the .env crate. Okay. Cool. I guess that was redundant. Uh, how do I say your name? Is it WGAFA? Uh, what am I working on? Well, I'm doing a little bit of code cleanup right now, but the project is called glowing telegram. 
Um, and it is a tool, I, I summarize it as a tool for managing stream recordings, but essentially the idea is using, providing a UI and providing automation. Uh, Gaffa is fine if you like that as well, okay. Uh, but provide, uh, well, here's the list of features, but ba basically provide a way to take um, these streams, like the stream right now, and turning it into episodes to put on YouTube, uh, which is basically what I decided to start doing as, start, as, as soon as I started streaming about a year ago, was, hey, I'll just upload this to YouTube because, well, I guess maybe it took me a couple months. Uh, yeah, it, it took me maybe a month to realize that, oh yeah, the VODs on Twitch eventually go away. Um, I ended up, because I wasn't recording locally, I, would, I ended up, you can transfer VODs from Twitch to YouTube, but you get whatever the quality is that Twitch stores the VODs at, right? So what I started doing was started re recording locally and then uploading that video, uh, like a useful application that's out of my league to make. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's been, uh, what, like six months in the making? Right, we're at 134 commits. Um, and it really started with just keeping track of the files that were being stored locally. Like keeping an organized list of like what the files were and uh, that sort of thing. And it's just kind of built up over time, right? So now the application looks like this, where I um, actually have, um, let's, let's look at a stream, right? So we have like, Here's a stream that happened uh, on March 25th. And then I have a list of all the video clips because the videos are recorded locally in like 20 minute segments. And that was really one of the things that made me want to do something because OBS is recording these in 20 minute segments. I have to stitch them back together if I don't want to just upload them as separate 20 minute videos that just cut off randomly, right? So. Uh, that's when I started to learn about DaVinci Resolve and video editing, uh, and I would just stitch them together into one like three long, three hour long video, and that's that's all well and good. But I wasn't really happy with that, and I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to eventually get to doing more edited content, but um, I'm kind of time limited, right? So I have time to work on this project on Sundays and you know every once in a while, but I don't have time to like scrub through videos and make really nice edited content, unfortunately. But what I do have is time to um, do speech to text transcription <laughs> and silence detection on the audio of my speech in the, you know, in the stream and then have a thing to let me pull out episodes from the timeline. Uh, let's see. Azine says, thanks for your response. Currently we use TRPC and Prisma for web development, but only for smaller projects. For larger ones, we usually use Java. I decided to try my hand at systems programming with Rust caused by previous experience with C and C++. It was challenging during university. Yeah, uh, I have long ago memories of like learning C and C++ and many seg faults, right? Um, I think there will be different challenges in getting up to speed with Rust, but I think those challenges in understanding them, unlike a seg fault where it's just, oh, <laughs> I'm addressing memory that was freed or you know some nonsense. Um, you're gonna, you're not gonna have those kind of runtime problems. You're gonna have compile time problems, although there are compile time problems you have with C and C++. Plus plus, but the point being is I think that whereas the kind of issues you have in those older low, lower level programming languages is you're just going to keep on getting them until you, you know, you spend a lot of time using them. The errors that you're going to get on Rust when you learn what they're coming from, you know, borrow checking stuff, right? Once you internalize that, um, that's going to be much more achievable than writing perfect C code. <laughs> and um, 
will, will be, you know, you will be writing better programs. Programs that will be, what, what do I mean by better? Well, things that are going to be able to handle like concurrency concerns and um, those sorts of things better uh, than the equivalent like C, C++ um, kind of memory, like do your own memory management sort of situations. Okay. So, um, somewhere there was a list of things that I wanted to fix. Ah, here we go. Let me click a button there. There we go. Okay. So, transcription API, check. Twitch API. Twitch API. So this is our wrapper around calling the Twitch API mainly for authentication and to fetch lists of streams for import um, so I don't have to manually create the stream record um, in the admin UI. So it's saying that line six is redundant. Line six um, and seven and eight and nine and 10. Right, so we don't need to say use for all of these things because they're the top level crates, I guess. The secret is used, but we're not, oh, I see. What did I remove? I must have removed, oh, I removed line eight. Line eight was, um, no, I misread. So switch API line six and seven are redundant. Okay. And Twitch API line nine, it's not line nine anymore. I'm pretty sure it's these ones. Yeah, there we go. Like you don't need to use tracing because it's a, it's a declared crate for this thing. Uh, and then task API, task API, SRC main. So probably dot envy line eight, line seven. Yeah, yeah, that one, those two. Makes sense. Task API, Twitch API, and then uh, unneeded return statement in complete chat.rs. Complete chat.rs. Uh, it was line 36, it might have moved now. Oh yeah, we don't need a return here. Um, but, Let's see, did that PR already get merged? Yeah, so we've already merged the PR. Let's um, let's just commit this, and then let me pull down um, changes from main. There we go, because we, we changed this file in the other pull request. So we don't need a return here, uh, as long as we don't have a semicolon, right? So. The, the last expression in this uh, function will be the return value. Mm, that's not what's happening here. Uh, remove unnecessary. Is that how you spell unnecessary? I don't know. Uh, let's go with it. It's gonna get squashed anyway. Um, there you go. All right, cool. New PR. All right, so who are we gonna raid today? Who are we gonna raid? 